Hola, and a warm welcome to Inside Grand Prix. Today, everything on the race in Brazil, including big hearts and big bills, privateer teams in Formula One. Plus, they call for the right field, F1 brakes. But first, we dip into the land of samba and carnival. Brazil, laid back, playful, exciting, proven World Cup and Olympics venue. With one of the world's most beautiful beaches, the Amazon rainforest, and for the 45th time, a Grand Prix. Among the drivers, there's many an avowed Brazil fan. Really uh, enjoy going there. It's a great country, and Sao Paulo is also a very special city. And what do they like the best? The truth? Yeah. The women. Brazil is known for a couple of particularly hot curves. No, we're thinking more of asphalt. A little way outside of Sao Paulo, Formula One has been making a regular visit since 1990 to the Autodromo Jose Carlos Pache, also known as Interlagos, the circuit between the lakes. The races there are usually very good as it's a fantastic old traditional circuit. Sao Paulo also often has a few weather highlights including rain. Then too you get some really spectacular action. Which is only fitting for a circuit belonging to the racing driver capital of Brazil. Sao Paulo has produced 16 Formula One sons, who between them have totted up 78 Grand Prix wins and five world championships. The numbers speak for themselves and say a lot too about Sao Paulo. But also Sao Paulo is a nice place. I mean, it's big, but also uh, fantastic food, all different types of restaurants. Uh, a lot of traffic. In Sao Paulo. If you're ever on the road in traffic in Sao Paulo, that's a real challenge. No wonder, with a population of 20 million, Sao Paulo is Brazil's biggest city, a blurred maze of roads and tower blocks. Every day, over 7 million vehicles transform the city into hopeless chaos. Crimes occur every couple of minutes, and yet Brazil thrills visitors with its charm. Brazilians are proud of that, proud of their country, their culture, and also of their Formula One race. Now, the underdogs of Formula One, privateer teams. In Formula One, every team is striving for points and podiums. But besides that, each also has its own agenda. For the works teams, F1 is a playground for their engineers, whose developments can also be utilized for road cars. Also on offer as a nice side effect is a huge and precisely calculated image boost for the brand. That too is exactly the raison d'etre for the two supposedly privateer teams, backed by big business. For Haas and Red Bull Motor Racing is above all an effective marketing tool. And then there are the others, the genuine privateer teams, whose whole business is Formula One. Manor, Force India, Sauber and Williams line up on the grid for one reason only. Our team are there to go racing, we're there to fight and we will go to any Grand Prix you'll tell us to because we love going racing and so we will just do what we always do and that's roll our sleeves up at Williams and, and get on with it and take the fight to the rest of the guys. However, it's not quite that easy as for many of the small teams every season is a fight for survival. The current financial problems that some teams face is well known. They of course repeatedly emphasize them and there is certainly a need to do something as we've always already tried, namely to cut costs, to bring costs down. To enter two cars for 20 races already costs a team over 75 million euros, of which 21 million is swallowed up by the drive system alone. Ongoing development not included. That way, they can't be competitive. Die Formel 1 is too teuer. Es kann nicht sein, dass man Formula One's too expensive. It's not acceptable that as a middling to lower end team you have to spend 120 million euros to then sit in the likes of 17th or 18th place on the grid. Something's got to change. 
Over the past 10 years, there have been many plans to cut costs, but all have come to nothing. And yet the basic formula for saving money sounds simple. Cost reductions can in general be achieved by making all the technical and racing rules a great deal simpler. However, that needs all the teams to be willing to make compromises. But that is precisely the sticking point. No team wants to forego any competitive advantage. The best example, an automatic car jack for a whopping 112,000 euros that shaves half a second off a pit stop. If you've got deep pockets, that amounts no problem. The difference between what a top team and the smallest team spend is around 200 million. However, teams on tighter budgets can't afford such things and are therefore at a disadvantage. And the often criticized profit sharing in F1 business operations tops off the downward spiral. Formula One's basic problem is definitely the distribution of money. It's extremely unfair because the gap between the rich and the poor is much too big. American sports do things very differently. They distribute the same from top to bottom, so everyone has an equal chance. It may well be that Bernie Eccleston will soon adopt a new approach with the new owners, Liberty Media. But before things get better, they're first going to get even worse. To blame for that are the new rules. Sadly, to date, it's repeatedly been the case that changes have led to more being spent. The 2017 rule amendment is no cost-cutting plan. The modification is a huge financial burden on the privateers especially. But necessity is the mother of invention, and new rules also offer an opportunity. After all, unorthodox approaches in Formula One are often the key to success. Now, a small part of big importance, the wheel nut. In elite motorsport, tenths of a second are often the difference between winning and losing. Nowhere is this seen so clearly as in a pit stop. So the pit stop is as crucial, if not more so, than any other aspect of the Grand Prix. What happens in the pit lane decides races. Mistakes can cost not just victory, but even the whole race. In Austin, a jammed wheel nut proved Kimi Raikkonen's undoing. As a result, he had to retire. Wheel nuts may not be the most glamorous part of a Formula One car, but they're among the most important. As pit stops have evolved, so too have the demands made of wheel nuts. Previously a basic iron part, now high tech. What we have here is 11 years of wheel nut development in pit stops ever since the beginning of Red Bull Racing. I think perhaps um, you could probably divide them into two sections really, the section that was refueling and the section that's, um, that's happened post refueling era. So we start at the beginning with the very first type of wheel nut. It was actually an off the shelf item um, which bought from a third party supplier. We used that for, for three years but it was very heavy and um, we made the decision uh, a little later into the refueling era that um, we would fit some big carbon discs to the front of the car that were attached to a wheel nut and we knew at that point that we were going to be slowing pit stop times down quite considerably but it didn't really matter because we were connecting a fuel hose to the car we knew that normally the fuel load would be a minimum of five seconds so we were quite happy with the four second tyre change at that time Everything changed in 2010 when refueling at pit stops was again banned. All that mattered anymore was the speed of the tyre change and the development of wheel nuts and a wheel gun really took off. In 2013 came a world record. In under 1.923 seconds, the Red Bull pit crew with Mark Webber in Austin delivered the fastest pit stop to date in Formula One history. The silent hero, the wheel nut. It was its sophisticated design that made the record at all possible, but at the expense of reliability. Bittersweet memories have here in uh, at Red Bull because this gave us our fastest ever pit stop time in Austin, um, but also it was uh, partly the reason why we lost a wheel in the pit lane with Mark Webber in uh, Germany. So, as I say, bittersweet memories there. In ongoing development since then, an increasingly major role has been played above all by the wheel nut's aerodynamic properties. 
This is the, the wheel nut that we're using on the front axle of the car at the moment. It's a um, very complicated assembly, very expensive assembly. So, 11 years of wheel nuts. At this year's Grand Prix in Azerbaijan, the Williams pit crew with Felipe Massa were able to match the world record, but not break it. Even three years on, 1.92 seconds appear to be the limit of what's possible for man and machine. What the pit crews can do in 1.92 seconds, we know. But what can Daniel and Max do in the same time? We'll leave pit stops to the pros and be intrigued to see when the next record is set in Formula One's millimeter precise choreographed pit crew ballet. And now three pros guide us around the circuit between the lakes. Brazilians are so passionate and fun and outgoing. I like the colors there. And obviously they've got a great football team. Sao Paulo is, you know, a special, crazy city. There's something about that town that I like. It's the Brazilian lifestyle, the food there, the people, the women. Everything is kind of special and, and really attracting in Brazil. And the track itself as well. Uh, all the legendary stories and, and championships that have been decided there. And you just feel that history and you know, the emotion, the passion and everything that, that belongs to racing. You can really touch and feel it there. Um, and that's something that I personally really like and I think also sometimes part of the reason why I perform there quite well, usually. Where there was a real issue in the race, especially around pit stops, because we, we actually on the pit will have, to a certain extent, a lot more information than you do. We can see what weather front's coming in, how much rain's coming in, who's already taken wet tires. But actually, we are very reliant on you, the driver, with your instinct, with your belief, as to whether or not you're able to stay out there. For example, if it's dry but it's just becoming wet, that extra lap, that's your decision, that's you that makes that call. How, how do you do that? What do you decide? What, what gives you the feel for that? Well, that's where communication and teamwork is, uh, it's, is at its most crucial, you know? And mm. um, so I really, I take on board all the information that you're giving me, and then out there, it's, it's never easy. Yeah. And I just need to, you know, have, have a feel for it and trust my instincts. And the difference, maybe it's worth accentuating that the difference can be 10, 20 seconds of lap time. It can be a spin, it can be a loss or a win. It's a short lap, it's tricky, it's not easy, um, especially it's, it's physically for the neck because normally all the tracks are uh, clockwise. Sao Paulo is anti-clockwise and very bumpy, so um, that makes it quite tough for the neck. You break into the last corner where the tyres are so hot from all the breaking into the previous corners so you have the cars often fishtailing. Really important to keep the minimum speed up and keep the steering as straight as possible all the way down the straight. Looking forward to going there. I won my world championship there in 2008. This was a track Ayrton always wanted to win at so if I could win that that's kind of a salute to him. I'm really looking forward to the race. I hope you enjoy it too. And now to the latest standings. The battle at the top carries on to the next race. Following Hamilton's win, only 19 points now separate him from teammate Rosberg. The lines are drawn. Red Bull are as uncatchable for Ferrari as the Reds are for Force India. However, the fight for fourth remains exciting. The fastest lap was produced for the fourth time by the Honey Badger, Daniel Ricciardo. In the pit lane, no team is more consistent. For the 13th time, the Williams pit crew produced the quickest pit stop, this time with Felipe Massa. A quick pit stop, after which it's on to the next lap of Inside Grand Prix. Then, with a high-tech component that only really gets going at 350 degrees Celsius, Formula One's carbon brakes don't go away.